Morning. Back from the long weekend. I don't know if you know this, we still met last week while you were at the cottage. Uh, there were a few of us. Be kind to us, invite us next time. We would like that, but no, it's good to see you all back. We got some, some newlyweds here. Jack and Ellie just got married on Friday. 36 hours and they're back at church. I don't know what that says, but hey, welcome. We're so stoked and uh, it's great to be with you, whether it's your first time here or not. My name's Mark, if we haven't met yet. And today we are in the next part of our series, Stuff You Didn't Hear in Sunday School. And after last week, you came back. You came back for more. And uh, if you missed last week, we covered a big story. We covered Sodom and Gomorrah. That was a lot. I had to give a PG-13 rating to that one just to kind of warn people. And the, the major theme last week was the way we misappropriate stories to exclude people made in the image of God, people who should have a seat at Jesus's table. I'll leave the rest of that to you going back online, watching on YouTube or the podcast to get caught up because we got lots to cover today. Good news is I don't really have to give a rating warning today. I don't think it's going to be too intense. I mean, we're going to cover some biology, which is kind of hilarious because like I did terrible. I did grade 10 science twice. Um, You know, my first year university, even though it was Bible college, because it's a liberal arts degree, you have to do a biology class. There were six of us in the class because it's this, you know, private Christian university and they they couldn't afford an actual prof to be there full time. So they would get a professor from U of T to come over for that one class. It happened to be Trefina's dad, who I was dating at the time, would later marry. The fact that I married her should tell you that I did pretty good in that class. So uh, if at any point when I'm covering biology, you're like, stay in your lane, Mark. You're a pastor. This isn't your role. I did really well. I got an A- minus in first year university biology. So totally qualified for what we're going to cover today. Um, and there's a lot of other fun stories about having your girlfriend's dad as the prof, but that's for another sermon analogy on another day. Um, But hey, uh, today we are covering another topic, another group of people who often get left outside of Jesus's table. You know, often people treated with vitriol and contempt, and I'm actually really excited for today's message. We got some heavy lifting to do. Uh, Today's story is from Acts chapter 8. It's a story of the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, I always love to give extra credit where credit's due. So sometimes I use, you know, many different theologians and books and I'll point to quotes and things. But um, there's one theologian uh, and pastor, Zach Lambert, who I'm just incredibly grateful to. It was years ago, I heard him first preach on this story. And I thought to myself, I didn't hear that in Sunday school. And so I'm just really, really grateful for uh, him and just want to make sure to give credit where credit's due, even just in some of the influence of this years ago in my thinking. And and even you'll see that drip through in this message today. Um, But first thing, before we even get into it, is if you look at the title, you know, just go back to that first slide, Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch. You'll probably see that in your Bibles when you go to Acts 8. You probably think what I think, which is, what's a eunuch? You know, it's a concept from the ancient world that we don't really encounter anymore, and that's eunuch. What is a eunuch? So I'm gonna take some time to explain this concept because otherwise I'm gonna read this story and you're not gonna get it. You're not gonna get the punchline. You're not gonna get any part of it if you don't understand the history, okay? So in the ancient world, when you look at history and even in the Bible, and we're gonna cover that in a minute, eunuch was an umbrella term used to describe someone in the sexual and or gender minority. Eunuchs were very common in the ancient world. So common, in fact, that when Jesus is teaching a sermon, he actually uses eunuchs as a sermon analogy. He lays out all the different kinds of eunuchs that there were, because remember, it's an umbrella term. Here are the categories that Jesus gives us in Matthew 19, okay? He's not teaching about eunuchs. He's using them as an example. And in that, we just see all the different terms. So here it is. This is what Jesus says. He says, for there are eunuchs who were born that way, eunuchs who've been made that way by others, and there are those who choose to live like eunuchs. Jesus is saying, hey, there's, there's lots going on here. So let me break those through for you for what we learn in history, okay? First off, the most popular way you would find in history was eunuchs that were made that way by others. This is referring to someone, here comes the biology, ready? Uh, who was physically castrated for a job, for employment, okay? Just to get everyone up to speed, if you don't know what castration is, it's to surgically cut off the male-specific organs. Okay, deep breath here for a second. All right, I want you to remember this is also a time in history when they didn't have anesthesia or morphine, okay? Why would someone do that? 
The belief was if you castrated a male, you would take away their sex drive and you took away their ability to have sex. So the idea is you were creating someone who could be trusted as a servant or security guard in a house of royalty. And they were safe for a princess or the queen or the harem. Basically, the thought was there's no risk of the queen having an affair with her bodyguard. Why? Because he didn't have the tools, so to speak. At least that was the thought, okay? Now, um, many cultures practiced this in the ancient world. It was horribly inhumane, but it's important to understand this happened. It was so common, Jesus used it as an analogy to make a point about another sermon that he was talking. He was actually talking about divorce in that category, in that sermon itself, okay? Um, now for eunuchs, this was often done pre-puberty and then because they no longer had the ability to create testosterone, it meant they would have softer skin, less body hair, higher pitched voices. They were overall weaker. And some people saw that as an advantage for how they would use their eunuchs for business purposes. Alternatively, some people would wait post-puberty so the young man could develop strength, and this way they could be used as security and yet still not be a threat to the queen. Not saying this is a good idea. Again, this is horrible. It's just a reality, and this is what Jesus is referring to when he says eunuchs that are made that way by others. He's just calling out something that's a reality. That's category number one, made that way by others. Category two, born that way. Again, covers a few options. This included children who were born with unclear genitalia or who had genitalia from more than one sex. Uh, we're gonna discover later, we'd call that today intersex or genitalia that didn't function typically or was damaged or simply someone with no desire for the opposite sex. You could summarize this second category as men who were born unable or unwilling to be aroused by a woman. These people would also be included in this unique workforce called eunuchs. So that's category two. Then there's a third category, and there are those who choose to live like eunuchs. Some people chose to be eunuchs. What? Why would you choose that? But this is the ancient world. It's messy. It's a hard world to live in. Manual labor sucked. So some people chose to voluntarily go under the knife because it meant they wouldn't have to work in the fields. For some, manual labor was not as appealing as working in the palace. So they voluntarily went through this process. Here's the bottom line. There's three different ways that someone ended up as a eunuch, but regardless of how you became one, the one thing that is for sure, it was not an easy or glamorous life. Your body often matured differently than your peers. You had trouble with simple things we take for granted, like going to the bathroom. You were often seen as the other in society. History shows us the difficulty they faced. You know, uh, one historian records a quote from Roman, uh, Roman called Pliny the Elder, and he called eunuchs the third gender. He called them half males. In the scriptures, in the religious culture of the day, there were even stronger negative views of eunuchs for so many reasons. First, they were seen as cursed by God because whether by their own choice or something beyond their control, they weren't having any children. From the first pages of scripture, children are seen as what? A blessing. And so people assumed you were blessed if you had children and cursed by God if you didn't have kids. So they're perceived as cursed. That's the first one. Second thing is people who are seen as cursed are often thought that the reason they're cursed is because they did something immoral. So now they're seen as cursed and immoral. That's two strikes against them. Then there's the ceremonial rules in scripture, which also reflect exclusion from the community. Deuteronomy 23.1 says this, if a man's testicles are crushed, here it comes. I'll just read it to you. Oh, there it is. Are crushed or his penis is cut off. He may not be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. Did you cover that one in Sunday school? No, we're covering it today. No, I'm kidding. We're not. But you, you get the point, right? We see the same in Leviticus, the exact same thing. Stanley Hauerwas says eunuchs were seen as a direct affront to Israel. And being a eunuch wasn't something you could hide easily. As I said, you often developed differently. Eunuch was an identity in the ancient world and a bad one at that. So that's getting everyone up to speed on what a eunuch is. It's an umbrella term for a group of people who we would say is a gender and sexual minority, okay? Jesus doesn't see them as people over there and lump them in with a broad stroke. He takes the time, even in a sermon analogy, to make another point, to acknowledge the issue is complex 
And there are all kinds of reasons and challenges facing this minority group that has suffered greatly in the ancient world. That's what a eunuch is. Now, we get into, when we get into our story in a few minutes, you will have some context. Now, as we begin talking about gender diversity in the Bible, in the same way that Jesus takes time to clarify all the details of one of the gender conversations of our day, I felt it was important to clarify the gender conversations in our day. You don't need to go far to hear debates raging around gender, conversations about pronouns and bathroom use, athletes and schools and teachers and medical care and medical intervention. It is the topic of our generation. It is full of vitriol and yelling across party lines. And today I think we're gonna see this story of the Ethiopian eunuch gives us a lot of wisdom as to how to navigate that conversation. Whether you're here and you've been very involved in this conversation or you've been sitting on the sidelines, I hope the story we're about to cover in a few minutes does for you what it did for me, which was to push me out of my comfortable little box and push me towards becoming more like Jesus, towards more and more people. So one final step before we get into our story today, we gotta define some terms in our world. Now we don't all need to agree on positions. We got lots of diversity here at Lakeside and I love that. Um, but we at least need to understand and use the same language. So when we you know, talk and disagree, at least we're using the same terms so we understand. So a lot of these terms I'm just gonna walk through are from Miriam Webster. Um, don't try and memorize, don't try and take notes like you're in biology class. I'm, I'm not expecting you, there's no test next week to know this. It's just gonna help you as we have our conversation, okay? So let me just go through some terms, okay? Cisgender. This is the first one. A person whose gender identity corresponds with the sex the person was identified as having at birth. A person, basically, here's an example. A person born male and identifies as male. Born male, identifies as male. You with me? Okay, just nod. Just, yeah, okay, great. We're only one. We got a few more definitions to go, okay? Next one, heterosexual. This is someone uh, with sexual or romantic attraction to someone of the opposite sex, Okay, now if you put those two together, um, you get uh, cishet. So cisgender, heterosexual, cishet. Cishet folks make up the majority of the population. I'm cishet, Uh, many of you are as well, statistically, okay? Then there's another category, and that's the LGBTQ plus community, okay? There are other letters, 2S, IA. There's debate even within the queer community, which letters, where do they go before or after, It's a conversation for another day, okay? For the sake of today, I'll use the umbrella term queer community just for the sake of simplicity. And a simple way to remember the LGBTQ plus community or the queer community is it's a whole bunch of categories for anyone who is not cishet. A whole bunch of categories for anyone who is not cisgendered heterosexual. Everyone tracking? You're doing great, great. Okay, here we go. Now, most people I talk to have a pretty good understanding of the first three letters, lesbian, gay, bisexual. There's a lot more confusion around T for transgender and I for intersex. And we see that confusion play out in our world, our schools, media, protests. The conversation is full of vitriol, violence. In fact, trans folks are constantly weaponized. Stats tell us they're far more likely to experience violence in their life, four times more likely to be more murdered than non-trans folks. Four times more likely to be murdered. So let's camp here for a few minutes. And if ever you felt like, I just don't understand trans folks, the trans community, I'm gonna give you a few more definitions that will help you enter into this conversation, okay? The term sex, this is rooted in physical attributes like genitals, hormones, chromosomes, things that develop and things that develop during puberty, the parts you might say, that would identify someone as male or female. Now, biologically speaking, when it comes to sex, there's three major categories, female, male, Intersex. If intersex is a new term for you, it was for me a few years ago. It's actually a medical term. Ask a doctor. It's in the medical textbooks. It's a category of people who either are born with unclear genitalia or genitalia from both sexes um, or some other variation. Sometimes it's visible at birth. Sometimes it becomes very apparent at puberty. And sometimes it's not physically apparent at all. The American Journal of Human Biology estimates 1.7% of everyone around roughly the same amount of people who have red hair are intersex, 1.7%. So that's the category of sex. That's the biological characteristics. Then there's gender. Sex and gender are not the same thing. Sex is rooted in what? The physical attributes. Gender is the behavioral, cultural, or psychological traits typically associated with sex. 
So you would see this depending on where you grew up, right? It's impacted by social and cultural patterns. Think masculine and feminine, right? And how broadly we define that. Depending on where you grew up and when you grew up, you might define those differently. Masculinity in Northern Alberta may be a little bit different than masculinity in East Asia. Femininity in one culture and country might be meal prepping and in another that same task may be seen as masculine. The examples go on forever. The time and place in history deeply impacts how we see gender. And with that said, the amount gender is affected by sex at birth is debated. And how gender should be impacted by God's biological design, also debated. Our common language, even amongst peers, shows us how differently we view this. Someone will say, well, boys will be boys. She's such a girly girl. She's not your typical girl or you can do whatever you want. Don't let everyone tell you you can't. Or nobody, playing with Barbies is for girls. We've heard all kinds of ideas of how gender should play out based on sex. And religious folks at times are also guilty of perpetuating gender norms, finding verses to try and prop up certain ideals. Robin showed us a few weeks ago when she unpacked Proverbs 31 and the way it's been weaponized to try and pigeonhole women in some cultures. When the truth is, it was doing the opposite. So bottom line, sex and gender are different. Last two terms, we're almost there friends, then we get to our story. Transgender, a person who feels a sense of disconnection between their sex and gender identity. According to the DSM-5, which is the diagnostic textbook for the American Psychiatric Association, where many of us get a lot of the definitions we use and work throughout our life, the DSM-5 calls this last term, gender, this transgender, gender dysphoria. And it is a clinically significant distress or impairment related to a strong desire to be of another gender, which may include the desire to change primary and or secondary sex characteristics. There's overwhelming consensus in the medical field that gender dysphoria is real. The vast majority of people who identify as transgender, whether they've transitioned or not, regardless of how they choose to live, have gender dysphoria. Usually people begin experiencing gender dysphoria as children. A recent study from the American Medical Association Journal says 73% of transgender women and 78% of transgender men first experience gender dysphoria at or before age seven. You could average that out to 75% of transgender folks experience it at or before age seven. Now I've personally had the privilege of getting to know trans folks in my life and in my work. I've had the privilege of having coffee with them, sitting with them, hearing their stories. I've had the privilege of talking with parents who are helping their children navigate gender dysphoria and how incredibly overwhelming it is. I've listened to story of people, people, stories of people wrestling with and navigating life with gender dysphoria, whether they've chosen to transition or not, or seek medical intervention or not. I was overwhelmed with how hard their journey had been and how painful and how lonely a road they traveled. To hear the lack of community care and support or the lack of people even taking the time to understand is one of the major reasons trans folks are at such a disproportionately high risk of suicide. Data indicates 82% of transgender individuals have considered suicide, 40% have attempted it. You know what the national average for attempting is? 0.6. Amongst trans folks, people experiencing gender dysphoria, 40% have attempted suicide. I've been in church my whole life. I have heard almost every struggle under the sun. But when it came to learning about trans folks, people suffering from gender dysphoria, people disproportionately at risk of losing their lives for over 30 years of my time in the church, I've never heard anything about them. Never heard anything about how to care for or support them. And honestly, as a pastor for 15 years, for a long time of that, I never took time to understand this community and these folks. Something I deeply regret to this day. The only time I heard them talked about was fear-based rhetoric about their agenda or what they are trying to do to us. Nobody ever talked about people with gender dysphoria or explained the unique struggles they face as gender minorities. And that's not okay. These are people made in the image of God and worthy of love. So today I wanna to jump into our story of the Bible that you probably never heard in Sunday school about a gender minority 
and how the early church responded and how we can be, learn to be more like Jesus and begin to navigate these incredibly polarized waters. You ready? Acts cha chapter eight, verse 26 this is in the New Testament. It's the stories of the early church. Jesus has just come back. He's sent his disciples out to tell people about Jesus, start the Jesus community. And we find this story early on in Acts. Acts 8.26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. I love this, okay? It's so fascinating. The angel doesn't tell Philip who he's going to meet. I can't help but wonder if this was intentional, as in, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Just head down to Gaza for now. Okay, so he started out, he started out and on his way met an Ethiopian eunuch. There's our word that we are now all experts on. Eunuch is a what? It's an umbrella term for a gender and sexual minority. We don't know how he became a eunuch. Was it his choice? Was he forced as is most common? Or was he born intersex with unclear or multiple parts? Or was he born without a desire for women? We don't know. All we have in this story is the umbrella term, eunuch. So he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Kandaki, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This fits our definition, a eunuch who works with royalty. Why? Because it was seen as safer, understood that way at least. So let's put ourselves in the story. Philip is now in the presence of a person who doesn't fit the mold. First off, he's Ethiopian. The man was most likely black. He's a eunuch, and while he doesn't know how he became one, statistically, he was most likely surgically altered against his will, probably at a young age. Bottom line, he's had a hard life. His challenges have not been the challenges of his peers. He's probably struggled with a body he has not been able to make sense of. He's probably suffered from incontinence. His identity doesn't fit the mold. He is gender non-conforming. Remember the way Pliny the Elder would say it from back then? He's part of the third gender. He's half male. As the boys matured around him, his body did not change in the same ways. As he thought about his future, there was probably a lot of grief. His circumstances he mean, meant he would never marry or have children. The story continues. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. Gone to worship in Jerusalem, the epicenter of faith. And now he's on his way home. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. I love it. It's again, not who he's going to see, just, just stay near the chariot, see what happens. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. So then Philip, in his curiosity, got to him and he's like, do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. Look what he says. How can I, unless someone explains it to me? Now, this is fascinating. This is a person who is coming from the ends of the earth. In that time, Ethiopia was seen as the ends of the earth, okay? In their view. And he's so hungry for God, he travels to Jerusalem, the epicenter of Judaism, to worship. He's now heading home. And most likely, we assume from what we know about history, he didn't have a good experience. Why? Because he's a eunuch and eunuchs aren't allowed in the temple. We talked about that. So he's on his way home, having traveled so far to worship, traveled so far for a relationship with God, only to be told most likely, go away. You're not welcome here. How many in the queer community can identify with this man? who've tried so hard to be part of a faith community, to seek out faith and relationship with Jesus and the Jesus community, only to be told, go away. You're not welcome here. Or you're welcome here, but we know how that goes. And similar to so many I've met in the queer community, he's so hungry for God that he doesn't let humans get in the way of his quest for faith. I mean, look at the story. He's reading the book of Isaiah. Where did he get the book of Isaiah from? This is before the printing press. That's an expensive scroll, scroll that would have been handwritten. He probably bought it for a lot of money outside of the temple. And now he's reading it, but he can't make sense of it. And nobody will explain to him. That's his response. How can I, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And this, verse 32, this is the passage the eunuch was reading. And if you're new to Bible reading, it's from an Old Testament prophet, Isaiah, and it's a prophecy, a foreshadowing of Jesus 
And here's what it says. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before his shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. What's happening in the story? It's a prophecy of Jesus being crucified. What is crucifixion? Physical torture and mutilation that is outside of your control. That's what the metaphor of a sheep being led to the slaughter means. And the humiliation, what's that about? Crucifixion was literally nailing someone to a cross naked. And the line, who can speak of his descendants? Jesus would have no children. He was killed at a young age. I can't help but think the eunuch is reading this story and so deeply resonating with Jesus's suffering, resonating with Jesus's lived experience. When he reads the line, led like a lamb to the slaughter, do you think he's reminded of a time when he was held down and castrated by men for their own business venture? Does the word humiliation trigger something inside of him? And how humiliating the process was and how humiliating it's been for the rest of his life? Does he resonate with the idea of being deprived of justice? When he reads the line, who can speak of his descendants? Does he think, oh yeah, I get that. I'll never have children. I can only imagine that once he understands this text that it deeply resonates with him. He wants to know more. Look at what he says. The eunuch asks Philip, tell me please, who is this prophet talking about, himself or someone else? He's desperate to know. Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. I would love to be a fly on the wall for that conversation. I have no idea what they talked about, but clearly he became convinced about the goodness of Jesus because look what happens next. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here's water. What can, this stand, what can stand in the way of me being baptized? Clearly he learned about baptism in that conversation, right? He's like, what could get in the way? Now, if I'm Philip, if I'm Philip, I'm thinking, what can stand in the way of you being baptized and joining the church? Well, let's see, lots of stuff. Maybe I'll call my pastor and get the list. Let's start with the fact that you're a eunuch. You permanently have no ability to get married and have kids, which means in our view, you were cursed by God and immoral because godly offspring is a clear design in scripture is what I'd be thinking if I was Philip. And you don't fit that design. You aren't even allowed in the temple because you're unclean. I wonder if Philip even thinks to himself, man, we already got enough controversy in this Jesus movement. We got enough detractors. Wait till they find out a eunuch has joined our church. They're gonna laugh us out of town. That's what I'd be thinking if I was Philip. But Philip doesn't say any of that. Look what he says instead. He gave orders to stop the chariot. Both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. Philip goes for it. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again. But I love this line, but went on his way rejoicing. Why is this significant? Baptism was the symbol for welcome and inclusion into the family of God. Philip says with his actions, there's a seat at Jesus's table for you. There's a seat at Jesus's table for you. You know what isn't in the story? A debate about eunuchs. There's no debate about how he became a eunuch, just a baptism, the symbol for welcome and inclusion into the family of faith. No interrogation, no debate, zero conditions prescribing details for what the rest of this eunuch's life will be like. It's not there. There are no terms and conditions. Think about this. Just think about how significant this is. A gender non-conforming, gender minority baptized in the family of faith. Someone culturally seen as immoral and cursed by God, baptized into the family of faith. You know my favorite part? Multiple times in the story, Philip is directed by God. First through an angel, then through the spirit. I love the way Zach Lambert explains that detail. He says, so that everyone who reads this understands that the full inclusion of sexual and gender minorities in the family of God is God's idea excluding and marginalizing people based on their sexual orientation and gender identity is in direct opposition to God's design for his family and the local church. Let me ask you a question. Did you learn that story in Sunday school? That, that, that is why we are fully committed to full inclusion of sexual and gender 
minorities. Let me be really clear again. Queer folks are fully loved exactly as they are, and there are no exclusions or restrictions on where they can be involved in our church. Now, with that said, welcome and inclusion doesn't mean everyone in our community interprets scripture the same way, or that everyone agrees on the right way to move forward in some of these big questions that we're facing as a society. Gender dysphoria is real, and dealing with it is complicated and hard, and there are times where we will disagree. And yet, We can stay together as a faith community because the thing we all agree on is that our ultimate goal is not to agree on everything. Our goal is to become more like Christ. Christ Christ-likeness is our goal. And Christ-likeness in the New Testament is never gendered. Christ-likeness is spelled out most clearly in the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And guess what? None of those are gendered. Nowhere are they divided by gender. Every one of those is for everyone. I love the way Dr. Sandra Glenn says it. What God is interested in is the fruit of the spirit. For some, it's going to be the fruit of the spirit in a female body. For others, it's gonna be in a male body. And for others, it's going to be in an intersex body. But it's gonna be the fruit of the spirit no matter what your body is. At Lakeside, Everyone is invited to grow in relationship with Jesus and become more Christ-like, regardless of how they identify. So while we navigate all the conversations on this topic, let's just start off by realizing we probably won't agree all the time. Even amongst the queer community, there isn't consensus all the time. These are complex conversations, lots of debate as to what care looks like, questions about medicine and hormones and surgical intervention and transitioning and who gets the final say. Is it pastors and theologians or parents and kids and medical professionals? How does this impact bathrooms and sports? And we will have different opinions. So while we can and should talk about these things, they should be discussed from the safety of knowing that whether we agree or not, We are all welcome with full inclusion at Jesus's table. Agreement is never a litmus test to see if someone will experience our love, grace, compassion, and inclusion. Love to share a quick list I first heard from Zach Lambert that I think may be helpful in your conversations. Some of you may be having these conversations at lunch for the first time. It's a collection of ideas that he kind of picked up in his conversations with trans folks, people struggling with gender dysphoria, and people caring for and supporting and allying them, and how best to support and care for them. And here's the list that he kind of just put together. It's by no means fully conclusive, but uh, I'll just give it to you. Number one, he says, stop it with the hot takes online. I mean, we've been doing this now this morning for 35 minutes. We've barely scratched the surface on this conversation. A 60 second reel on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube is not gonna solve any issues or help anyone heal. It will polarize us further. Stop it with the hot takes. Number two, don't run up to trans people and tell them how awesome it is that they're trans. It's not helpful. Number three, do not judge families of trans kids. You have no idea what they're going through. Have compassion on parents who are doing their best that they can for their kids as they work through their own struggles and experience tremendous exterior pressure and conflicting information. Four, don't tokenize trans people for the purpose of virtue signaling. Five, don't share or tolerate hurtful jokes about queer folks. In fact, call it out. Number six, don't associate the queer community with higher rates of abuse or pedophilia by calling them groomers or predators. Number one, it's simply not true. And two, it leads to hurt, pain, exclusion, and violence. Remember the stats? And lastly, use someone's preferred name and pronoun. It is that simple. I really find it funny the number of times I've seen people who meet someone from another country and they're like, hey, what's your name? And the person says it and they go, whoa, I could never pronounce that. How about I just call you Jim? And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. You're okay calling someone else a different name if it's for your comfort, but not for theirs. Just use the name that someone asked to be called. And if you make a mistake, it's okay. Apologize and correct it. Friends, I am so committed to continuing to make our space more and more inclusive because everyone, everyone deserves a seat at Jesus's table. And we are all invited on this journey towards Christ-likeness. 
So as we move towards closing, another quick church update, continuing to push us in this direction. Last week, for those of you who are here, I gave a bit of a church update on our church finances and how some of our decisions toward radical inclusion had cost us community members and donors. And I shared that last week, if we're gonna continue to exist in a way that we do today and continue to fight to be an inclusive and safe space for countless people who've been marginalized and rejected from the church, that we were gonna need to change our church financial trajectory. And I invited anyone and everyone who calls Lakeside Home to begin giving financially. I encourage you to head to our website, sign up at any amount to be a monthly donor to say, I'm partnering with God in making sure that everyone has a seat at Jesus's table. And over the past few months, I've, I've got to written a lot of thank you cards for people who've begun giving for the first time. And, and the good news is we are making progress. Uh, so if you haven't yet, now is the time though, because we are literally just a few weeks from having to make some really hard decisions uh, with some critical staff, staff who are on the front lines of creating safe spaces for people of all ages and life experiences to have a seat at Jesus' table. And speaking of all ages, one other way that you can support Lakeside is this. A few months ago, I gave a health update for Rose Rabidou, our family ministries pastor. Um, Rose had been experiencing some serious health concerns for a prolonged period of time, and she'd been spending more and more time in the hospital, in and out of the hospital. Uh, she, since then, she's continued working through these health challenges, even though they often meant more and more trips back and forth to the hospital, and often scheduling and planning our kids' ministry from a hospital room. Rose has worked tirelessly and through constant pain while also preparing for major surgery. And now Rose has a date. On June 7th, Rose will be going in for major surgery with significant complications that will impact recovery time. The minimum expected recovery time is four to eight weeks. That's four to eight weeks where she will be out of the building with limited mobility. Rose has been doing an incredible job even while our staff team continues to be shorthanded. And now with the prospect in hand with the dates, we literally have 10 days before she's fully out of commission. So along with financial partnership, I'm also asking our community, even for the short term, can you email Rose? Rose's email is gonna be up on the screen and just say, just say this, you're gonna overwhelm her with love by saying this, how can I help? How can I help? How can I help? And you can begin to see what role there is for you. And there are all kinds of roles to help in family ministries from nursery to security, to the check-in desk and so on. Even one hour every four or six weeks can make a huge impact. So please like have her email just blowing up so that she has the next 10 days to kind of navigate with all of you to see how you can help out in this season. I know it would mean the world. So bottom lines, um, Love to do that. And I think that she would feel hugely supported in this season. Uh, let me uh, just thank you for letting you share. Let me share those updates. And let me uh, close with an encouragement to you. I'm gonna invite Randy to come up and just give us some space in a moment to reflect and ask the Holy Spirit how we can respond. But um, I got a few emails this week in response to last weekend's sermon about full inclusion. None bad, surprisingly. Um, but this one, I got permission to share an excerpt, and I want to read it to you now. Thank you, all caps, for that sermon. I'm 71 years old, and I've been waiting my whole Christian gay life to hear that truth preached from an evangelical-rooted church. As you said, deep faith, wide embrace. At points, it made me tear up, and or shout out, yes, God's yes is what I personally heard. Despite all the lies, I remain a committed follower of Jesus and a proud member of the queer community, seeking deep faith and wide embrace. For the first time in 50 years, I'm sending a church a financial donation to support your work and allyship. Friends, this person doesn't even live in Guelph or come to Lakeside. And they're saying, I wanna partner with God in the work of creating safe, inclusive space where we invite everyone to have a seat at Jesus's table. So I wonder if just for a moment we could be still and see how the Holy Spirit might inv be inviting us personally to make room for people to have a seat at Jesus's table, how we could share the radical love of Jesus with those around us. Let's just be still for a moment and see what or who the Holy Spirit brings to mind.
as you head out. This morning, I want to just remind you of a few things. Tonight, 6.30, you can get your tickets at the door uh, for the 1946 movie. Um, prayer teams are up at the crosses. They would so, so love to pray with you, pray with you through anything. Reminder that the youth center is open um, and youth are welcome to hang out there. And I'd love to bless you. If it doesn't trip your weird meter, feel free to hold your hands out just as a posture of receiving. In the same way that Philip experienced the Holy Spirit's leading, may you be open to the way the Holy Spirit is leading you and prompting you towards people traditionally excluded from the church and Jesus' table. Go in Jesus' name. Have a great week, friends. Thank you.